welcome to the next in our series of webinars on COP26. This is episode two, Road to Net Zero and Transport. I'm John Buttonshaw. I'm Laura Smythe. And we're from the Operational Risk Team here at Trevor Smith. And we consider lots of issues relating to carbon, net zero, have been tracking COP26 very carefully and have been over the last year or so discussing more and more issues in the transport area with, with our clients. It's clearly going to be a major issue on the agenda for COP26. They've set up their Net Zero Emissions Council um, for transport and increasingly it's becoming an area of focus. That's not surprising. From a UK perspective, transport is the largest uh, sector for emitting carbon emissions and globally it's maybe not quite so large but it's about 10% globally but concerningly it is the fastest rising sector which in many ways shows where we're making progress in energy generation and other areas bringing carbon down perhaps we need to sort of catch up the curve a bit more in transport and really try and bring those emissions down quite sharply to achieve our net zero aims. So Laura and I are going to talk about some issues around that for the next few minutes. We're going to sort of focus on three main areas. These are areas actually which the UK's Department for Transport uh, highlighted as key in its July 2021 policy in the area, but I think you know they pl apply universally across the globe. There are areas in which we're all going to need to get to grips with bringing down emissions. Uh, so they are active public transport people walking around, using public transport to get to work, how they get from places to places. They are decarbonising the roads. Vehicles inevitably will be used, we see in the future, and um, ways to decarbonise that. And then looking more at that supply chain and movement of goods and some of those heavier movements involved there and the particular challenges to decarbonising there. So without any further ado, Laura, I think you're going to discuss some of the issues of around the government's approach to active and public transport and, and things to be done there. Yeah, so the government's latest net zero transport strategy, which was published in July earlier this year, really highlights that COVID-19 has significantly changed the way we commute, shop, travel and do business. So we know, for example, that the total number of trips using public transport dropped significantly during the pandemic, which is partly as a result of an increase in home working practices. So as we slowly start to emerge from lockdown, it will be a case for the UK government, as well as governments around the world, to really try and look ahead and predict how we can use these changing commuting and transport patterns to reduce traffic and CO2 emissions. So one way of doing that is by focusing on improvements to public transport. The government recently introduced yet another slogan, the Bus Back Better Scheme, which, as you can see from this slide, involves the investment of £3 billion for buses in England outside London and supporting at least 4,000 zero emissions buses. To give you a sense of context at the moment, only 2% of England's local operator bus fleet is zero emissions. Another key goal is increasing walking and cycling, promoting ride sharing and higher car occupancy. For example, between March 2020 and July 2021, more than 300 new cycling and walking schemes were installed in the UK, with many more predicted to be on their way. Again, mostly as a result of the pandemic, cycling rose by 46% last year, which is a greater rise than across the whole of the previous 20 years, and easily the biggest increase in post-war history. A key question raised by the increase in cycling will really be whether the current planning system is agile enough to reconfigure our streets to fit these new paths, particularly in cities where space is already extremely limited. So I'll now hand over to John, who will give us a brief overview of some of the issues which come up in relation to the decarbonisation of road vehicles. It's not surprising anyone to, when I say decarbonising road vehicles, well, electric vehicles, they're the future. Um, we all know that. The UK government has thrown its weight behind that with the ban by 2035 on new petrol and diesel vehicles um, being sold. And as this slide on screen now will show, it's not alone in that, there's quite a few countries around the world adopting similar measures. Uh, you, you can see that there's quite a focus of those around Europe and the Americas, and there's some parts of the world where that's not yet been taken up. But I think that's going to be a key area for discussion at COP26, and we might expect to see a little bit more of a global concerted effort towards the phase out of um, petrol and diesel vehicles on our roads. Now, clearly, from a pure carbon perspective, that has to be a good thing. For electric vehicles to really bring down carbon, we need a green grid. And government in the UK's announcement recently that it aims to have a fully green grid by 2035 is certainly positive, but we need to make sure we 
track and stay abreast of that aspect of electric vehicles. And electric vehicle is only green if its energy input is. And then there's other sort of consequences of electric vehicles, maybe not directly related to carbon, such as their use of batteries. So these batteries are produced often using rare metals and other minerals, which may be very damaging to extract. And we don't yet really understand as a new technology how well these batteries will hold up, can we recycle them, what's going to be the impacts of long-term disposal, and all of that, which also has a carbon implication. Um, the, the vehicles are much heavier, and that has implications, you know, as well as just requiring certain energy to move. They also increase tyre wear, so you might start to see maybe perhaps more localised um, health pollution issues relating to increased uptake of electric vehicles because of that increase in tyre wear and particles, etc. So it's not to say these are definitely not the future, but there's still impacts that we're having to understand. And then, of course, the other key thing for this all to work is that rollout of the electric charging infrastructure and making sure that the grid is fit for purpose for a very different mode of use. And in some ways, that brings, as with every challenge, opportunities. So we could potentially be using all these thousands, hundreds of thousands of electric cars as a giant sort of fluid battery to store electricity when the sun isn't shining, when the wind isn't blowing and our renewables dipping down, rather than turning on gas engine turbines to bring the grid back up. Maybe we could be taking some electricity back from these cars and then it goes back out when the sun shines. That requires a very smart grid and it's one of the reasons why smart meters in people's homes is actually going to be quite important to making this whole net zero transport piece unlock in a way which is very beneficial. Um, but there's a lot more work to be done to understand and make sure the grid is ready and to make sure power can flow in the right time, the right places to sort of charge up these cars. And do you think that the private sector will be able to push this out on their own or do you think that government funding will be needed? Uh, that's the critical question. I think it's a question that's been quite vocally asked over the past few years. Um, we don't really have much clarity on government's position yet. It's clear when you look around the world, there are some countries, particularly in Europe, which have accelerated their rollout of charging um, infrastructure for vehicles you know, very quickly, and they had quite interventionist government programs which were there. In the UK, we don't tend to have seen those. We've seen some sort of sporadic funding for particular projects, etc., but not that sort of universal support with long-term um, support that the bigger kind of players, the big investors need to see to help them finance development at a huge scale. That's not to say it's What's happening isn't working. We're seeing you know, quite a fluid market with a lot of smaller players coming in. And um, if you do try and charge an electric car, it can be quite confusing as you have to sign up to like 100 different apps to charge a car at every single different operator. But it's quite a, it's quite a fluid market. Maybe that's a sign of a healthy market. Um, but certainly, I think over the next couple of years, we'll need to see if the market can keep up with that growing pace of electric cars and demand, or if a little bit more needs to be done to bring in some of the bigger infrastructure investors in place. We'll see. Um, Talking of sort of challenges, you know, we've got a reasonably clear route forward, albeit some big um, steps and obstacles in the way for electric vehicles. But it strikes me there's perhaps less clarity on where we're going with decarbonizing supply chains and heavier goods, you know, your planes, your trains, your automobiles. How do we move the, those around in a carbon efficient way? Um, and Laura, I think that's something you're going to talk about. Yeah, so um, we're talking about here the decarbonization of goods and a net zero target really requires a major change in how industries make goods and also what energy is used in order to transport those goods to end consumers. Um, so low carbon technologies at this level are still in the process of being explored. So for example, hydrogen is a promising energy source, but it remains to be seen whether it's really a plausible solution for cheaper, more carbon intensive energy sources. Again, the UK's government's net zero strategy touches on the topic of decarbonization of goods by pledging to decarbonize the UK's freight system, introducing pioneering new zero emissions technology, and slowly phasing out petrol and diesel HGVs. It also seeks to shift the amount of goods from road and air to more sustainable modes with digital solutions and data sharing to, produce, to increase efficiencies. And then finally, there's a focus on product innovation. So by that, we mean redesigning existing goods to be more sustainable, as well as designing substitutes um, so, which, for example, low carbon cement substitutes, which are using construction projects. So those are new goods that have sustainability in mind from the outset. So this ties into pushes in Europe towards sustainable products and circular economy type regulation, 
which has really been growing apace over the last few years. Um, an example of this that we've seen is the EU's recent Sustainable Product Initiative. In the UK, in June this year, we saw a similar piece of legislation, which is the Eco Design for Energy Related Products Regulations, which largely mirror the existing EU requirements, but also aim to lower the environmental impacts of energy related products by decreasing their energy usage and carbon footprint. UK's current fuel shortages and empty supermarket shelves have really shown how fragile our current just-in-time supply chain model for the provision of goods really is. It's clear that we'll need more detail in the months to come from the government as to how the decarbonization of goods will really work in practice, what impact it will have on supply chain models, and what cost distribution measures will look like. So in conclusion, it's clear that some ambitious changes are needed to the UK's transport uh, infrastructure in order to reach our net zero goals. As we've discussed, these include updates to public and active transport, advances in decarbonization of goods and vehicles, but very importantly, the underlying regulatory infrastructure and technical measures that are needed to support these advances. As such, governments and policymakers will need to ensure that the regulatory environment is fit for purpose and isn't hindering this fast-paced technological and social change, but is rather incentivizing it. So I think we can expect the global transition to zero emission transport to be a really important topic at this year's COP26. Um, and we really look forward to countries and stakeholders coming together to set out some measurable goals to make transport greener, more efficient, and more cost effective. Um, a lot of work to be done. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for listening. Thank you.